Good morning, South Point Church. How are we doing today? Yeah, are we doing okay on, a, on this cold uh, morning after the rain that we had come through last night? I've got my hands in my pockets trying to warm my hands up here. Um, now listen, I'm excited to be here with you today. Sunday is my favorite day. I know I say that every week, but it is. And the reason that it's my favorite is because you're, you're here. Uh, I mean, this is kind of if the pastor doesn't love Sunday, then the church probably has a problem. And fortunately, I, I love Sunday and I love our time together. And we've been in this series called Did God Really Say? And this whole series has kind of been challenging some core questions that we ask, like, who am I? Who is God? And we've been looking at what did God actually say about those things? Or what is it that God said to us? Or what, what should we believe about those things? And, and so we've been trying to get to some of the, the core identities that we wrap ourselves in and that we wrap God in. And today we're going to tackle one that, um, I'll be honest with you, it's one that I think more of us struggle with more than we would admit to. I think it's one that more of us struggle with than we know that we actually struggle with it. And for me, it's actually one that was probably the hardest to explain. And so I'll, I'll put it up here for you. And so the question that we're going to ask today is, is this, what is the best way to live my life? Or another way to phrase it, for those of you that think a little bit differently, is, is how do I get the best out of life? Now, this is something that, like I said, I struggled with, with explaining this to you. The, the, the message is there. The scripture is there. The curriculum is there. What Jesus said is there. But when I put myself in your shoes, as I try and do every week, and I think, why do you need this? Why do you need to answer this question? Or better yet, do you even ask this question? Is this a question that applies to your life? Has anyone this week asked yourselves the question of what is the best way to live my life? You know, I would say that, that probably not. It's probably not been a ton of people that have asked that because, I mean, I don't ask that a lot. The questions that I ask myself during the week are, how do I get to Monday? Or how do we get the kids in bed? Or how do we get through bath time? Or how is there always cheese on the floor? I don't understand, but it just always is there. Our family eats so much toast and cheese, and there's just always cheese and toast on the floor everywhere. Those are the things that I ask during the week. Or how do I get the best out of life? When's the last time that you asked that question? How do I get the most out of this? Now, this is something that we do. We do this when we think about family planning. We do this when we think about when to get married or how to have kids or uh, parents in the room. If you're trying to figure out where to send your kids to school, especially if you live here in the southern suburbs, it's incredibly competitive and hard to get your kids into a school. And you're thinking, what high school do I send them to or what preschool do I send them to? And you feel like you've got to make that decision the moment that they're born because you've got to go from the hospital to the school and fill out the application right then and there. Yes, it's true. So that's you asking, what's the best way to live life, or how do I get the best out of life? You're trying to figure that out. I mean, we're trying to figure that out. I think subconsciously, we try and figure this question out more than we actually ask this question. And so before I go any further into this message, and, and before I just make assumptions that you even ask yourself this question, because if you're not asking the question, then there's no point in answering it. Because at that point, it's just words. It's just me saying things and you hoping that you can pick things out of the ether and maybe apply those things to your life. But I want there to be more for you than that. And so before we start, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Whether you realize it or not, whether you know it or not, you ask this question all day, every day. Every decision that you make, every decision that, that you make as far as where do I go, who do I marry, who do I have lunch with, you know, anyone ever, I mean, I'm going to call a bunch of you out. I'm not going to name any names, but anyone ever been invited on the same Friday night to two different things at the same time? And you tell one person, well, you know, okay, I'm, I may be there. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, but I know this other person's going to invite me. And so if they invite me, I'm going to tell this other person no, because I'd rather go to this thing. And so you're playing this game. And you're weighing out, well, I don't want to say no, because if I don't have anything to do, then I'll go. But if something better comes up, then I'll instead go to this better thing that comes up. Yeah, I, listen, you all do this. I, I know that we all do that. But that, even that is this. It's you trying to figure out, how do I get the best out of life? How do I get the best out of my Friday night? And so I just wanted to establish that up front. That you may not consciously think about these two questions. But these two questions run and rule more of your life 
than you know or than you're aware of. And so in answering these two questions, there's two big motivators that direct us on how, how we try and, and find the best way to live our life or how we try and get the most out of life. And the two things that kind of compete with each other, and these are difficult to distinguish between the two because they look kind of the same and they feel the same and then everything in them is very, very, very similar. But there's a couple things that make them very, very different. And these are things that kind of motivate us and guide us as we try and figure out how to make decisions or how to get the most out of our life. And those two things, it, it's, it's good versus attractive. So it's, it's good things versus attractive things. Now, the difference between a good thing and an attractive thing is that a good thing, those are things that are actually good for us. So these are things that are like good morals or good values or good advice. And an attractive thing is maybe something that looks shiny or looks attractive, that pulls your attention to it, but it may not necessarily be good for us. It may not necessarily lead us to the place that we want to go or to a place where we want to end up. Now, again, these two things look so similar out in the real world. They look so much the same that sometimes it's hard to establish what is different between a good thing for me to make a decision based on or an attractive thing for me to make a decision based on. See, a good thing will always lead you towards something that's good for your life and that makes you a good person maybe in society or a good person in your family. An attractive thing will lead you to something that may end up being really, you know, bad for you. It's like I like to imagine as I was preparing for this message, I like to imagine if you're going down a road and as you're going down a road, you have a life decision that comes up. You're like, okay, how do I make this decision? What life decision do I make here? And it would be great if in all the forks of the road there was a label that said good thing. And then that would be easy. We would just all pick the good thing, right? I mean, that, that seems to make the most sense. This means yes, this means no, yes. We would all pick, we would all obviously pick the good thing. But that's, that's, but that's not actually what happens. As we go down the road, as we go down the journey of life and the road of life, there are things that are labeled good thing, turn this way. But then there are also things that are labeled shiny thing, new thing, attractive thing, pleasurable thing. And then we, we weigh those things out and we say, okay, well, here's the good way to go. Yes, I could make a good decision for my life. I could save money and I could put it into a retirement account or I could, I could pay off debt or I could do healthy financial things or this super attractive thing like this new car or this phone or watch or whatever it is. That's really, that's really attractive. I think I'm going to go towards the attractive thing. Or you may be walking throughout a, a rough spot in your marriage and in your marriage you're walking down the road of life and and you see that when you get to this crossroad of a decision, even though, even though there's all kinds of different options out there, you know that the good thing for you to do is to stay with that spouse and to work it out and to really hang in there. But the attractive thing is that person at work that's maybe a little bit flirty or, hey, maybe it's that the 45 minutes or an hour that you lay in bed and you flip through Instagram, you look at things maybe that you shouldn't. Those are the attractive things. And we want to say that we would always pick the good thing. Yeah, of course, I would pick the thing that is good for my life, duh, but we don't. We, more times than not, we pick the attractive things, the things that pull our attention away, the things that are shiny, the things that say, hey, hey, this will give you uh, instant gratification. This will th make you happy. This will make you full. This will make you complete. And so in our lives, we're, we're constantly weighing these two things up. Is it good or is it attractive? And once we categorize that, then we get to say, do I pick good or do I pick attractive? And most of the time we end up picking attractive. And so I want to kind of establish that what we have in the room is we have a room full of amazing people. You guys are good people. You guys are amazing people. And, and myself included, we've all made good decisions and we've all made attractive decisions. And they've both led us to different places in our lives. But today, the reason that I want to have this conversation with you today is I want to equip you with, with something, equip you with a way to take a look at your life and be able to actually intentionally ask yourself the question, what is the best life for me? And what is the way that I can get the most out of that life? Because after a lifetime, whether you're 10 years old or whether you're 80-something you're years old, after a lifetime of guessing good, attractive, good, attractive, good, attractive, you know what builds up over time? Regret, hurt, pain, remorse. 
I wish I didn't do that. I wish I didn't take that path. I wish I didn't go down that journey. Oh, I wish I could have done that differently. Oh, man, I wish I had chosen the good thing here, but instead I went with the attractive thing. So today is a day where we all get to kind of go back to ground zero and start over. It's a day where we get to say, whatever journey I'm on now, however many attractive decisions I made versus good decisions, we're going to start from ground zero today. And we're going we're gonna to move forward, and I'm going to equip you with a way to choose the good things for your life and to feel better about doing that as well. So the way we're going to do that, it's obvious because we're in church, is Jesus will actually tell you exactly the best way to live your best life. So we are going to look at, at what Jesus says about this. So it's, it's Jesus that is going to tell us exactly how to live our best life. It's Jesus that's going to paint the picture for us and tell us how to do that. And we're going to look at, you know, it's such an amazing thing to see that Jesus was actually this really smart teacher. He was this amazing rabbi. And everything that he said and everything that he did, he did with, like a, with an incredible amount of purpose. And he didn't say things just by happenstance or, or anything. He said things for a reason. He said things with an actual purpose. In fact, when it's important for us today because we're going to look at two of Jesus' sermons and these are short, so don't feel like this is going to be a super long message. Jesus' sermons were like six verses long. And I know some of you wish that mine were, were that long as well, but too bad. I'm up here, you're out there. No, I'm kidding. So G Jesus has these two sermons that we're going to look at. And it's in these two sermons that we're going to kind of figure out and learn uh, the way that we can live our, our best life. And so if we look at the first sermon... We can actually, Josh, there's a slide that I want you guys to see here, and it's about how Jesus' sermons point towards the kingdom of God. So it's Jesus' sermons where his declaration, it's important that we get this, because we need to understand the motivation behind why Jesus said what he said. He didn't say it because he was Jesus, and he knew that one day the Bible would be written about him. No, he said it because it means something for us. And so Jesus' sermons, because we're going to look at two of them, where his declaration of the kingdom and the way one should choose to live. So essentially, Jesus is saying, this is the way that you should choose to live. If you choose my kingdom, this is how to live your life. And so we can look at the first sermon that Jesus preaches. And, and this we find in the book of Luke. And in this first sermon, we're just going to touch on it quickly. But Jesus shows up, and, and to give you a little context, Jesus shows up to a temple because he's known as a teacher, as a rabbi. And so he comes into the temple, and this kind of story unfolds. And, and I want you to think about this literally. I want you to think about this like, like it's watching a movie. Okay, I, I wanna, I, I'm hoping that I've not overthought it and built into some emotion into it that isn't there. I hope that you guys can kind of get it. So I'm going to guide you through this situation, and I kind of hope you feel the awkwardness of the situation that's here. I hope that that you kind of feel um, the tension that's in the room with Jesus and the people that he delivers this sermon to. So let, let's look at the, at the message here. So in Luke 4, 16 through 21, Jesus, he goes to Nazareth where he's been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, so that's the day of worship, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. So Jesus was a Jew, so he goes into the Jewish temple. That's why he did that. And so he stood up to read, because he was a rabbi, a teacher. This was not an abnormal thing. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So here's Jesus, enters the temple. He, uh, he, he takes a place where he can teach. And the scroll of Isaiah, so in your book or on your app, it would be Isaiah. That, that as, a, as a scroll, as a written scroll, is handed to Jesus. And so Jesus is getting ready to open that up. And that is going to be his first sermon to the people. So imagine that, that setting. I don't know why, but I always think about it being dusty and there being everything made out of stone and lots of neat right angles. That may just be me, but Jesus is there and he's about to do that. So let's go to the next verse. And so unrolling it, Jesus is unrolling this thing. He found the place where it is written, so he knew what he wanted to say. He's searching through, searching through. Jesus didn't have Google or the Bible app. He couldn't just type it in. I wonder how long it took Jesus to, to kind of filter through this rolled out you know, script. Maybe it was just a second. Maybe it was a few minutes. But he finds where he wants to go. And in verse 18, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. And so Jesus has made these huge claims. He's saying, hey, Jesus, Jesus is saying, I have been sent to do these things. I've been sent to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery for the blind, set the oppressed person free. It's like a big statement. This is a huge statement. This isn't the day and age of Facebook and Twitter where you can say anything and nobody pays any attention to it because there's so much noise. This is something where when Jesus says this out loud, this is a huge, huge ordeal. And so let, let's go to the next verse. Next verse in verse 19 says, Jesus continues, and he says, He was also sent to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus rolls up the scroll. He gives it back to the attendant. And this is maybe where I've overthought this thing a little bit. And, but he gives it back to the attendant. And then he sat down. So imagine, Jesus makes this amazing statement. Don't overthink this. But maybe think about it a little bit. He gives this amazing statement, this, this, this kind of rule-breaking, groundbreaking statement. He sits down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue are just fastened on him. I like to imagine Jesus sitting maybe in a chair with his legs crossed, just kind of casually like hanging out. You know, if he were with us, he'd you know, maybe sip on a cup of tea or on a cup of coffee, and everyone's just staring at him. They're just staring and it's almost like I like to imagine Jesus saying, oh, oh, you, oh, you didn't get it. Oh, I see. So you're, you're staring at me because you haven't figured it out yet. Okay, well, just to put two and two together for you, he goes on and he says, uh, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So he's basically saying, ah, okay, I know you're staring at me because I said some amazing things, uh, but all those things that I just said, because you heard it today, I'm, I'm that person. And that's the end of his sermon. He gets up and he walks out. So just in that first sermon, what Jesus has done is Jesus, he's announced his, his qualification. He's announced his intent to the people and he's announced his purpose to people. Jesus is, is, is announcing, that this is my qualification, my intent, and my purpose because he wants people to know this is why I came. I came because God sent me. I came to fulfill these things. My purpose is to do these other things. And so it's important for us right off the bat to know that in Jesus' first sermon, he doesn't beat around the bush. He pretty much just flat out tells us, this is exactly why I'm here and what I'm here to do. And so now we're going to fast forward in Jesus' ministry and go to his second sermon. And in this second sermon, to give you a little bit of context around this, Jesus has gone out after he's done the, the first sermon. Jesus goes out and he picks his disciples. And not only does he pick the 12 that we know about, but he picks a whole bunch of others because if you don't know, Jesus as a teacher, as a rabbi, he had a bunch of people that followed him. He had like a whole camp of people, men, women, everybody that kind of followed Jesus around. And as they followed Jesus around, he picked out of those people, he picked the, the 12. And out of those 12, he kind of set them apart. They were going to be, you know, his special disciples. And before Jesus... Um, has this sermon that we're going to look at now. Jesus knows that he's about to send people, all of his disciples, out to do ministry with other people. And so Jesus wants them to be equipped to teach things the right way. So I, I think it's interesting for us to kind of understand that Jesus is not haphazard in anything. He's training his disciples. He's training people. He wants to make sure that when they go out and they preach or when they go out and they minister to people, they do it from the right place with the right heart and they're, they're armed with the right knowledge on how to do it. And so in this sermon, what you have is you have a, a huge gathering of people that come down to meet Jesus because he has his reputation for being a healer. And so Jesus shows up and a whole bunch of people show up and a whole bunch of Jesus' disciples show up and the 12 disciples are there and they're all there. And Jesus says, okay, I'm going to take this opportunity to set it straight. Now, th this is the point where we get to learn from Jesus the best way to live our life. So remember in the beginning when I talked about this whole like we've made good decisions, we've made attractive decisions and, and how do I live my best life and what is the best thing for my life? This is where we're going to answer that. So I don't want there to be any guessing. I, if you're taking notes, you're trying to figure it out, you can tune in now. This, from this point on, this is where we figure out the best way to live our life. 
And so Jesus has got everybody gathered. And he begins his sermon. And he starts with, with this. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And then he goes on in the next verse. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. That's the day that everyone hates you. Leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. This is sounding amazing. This is an absolutely incredible sermon. And then the next verse, Jesus really hammers it home. And he says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Everyone in here that laughed, you're going to mourn and weep. <laughs> ah, you're getting a double portion. Woe to you... When everyone speaks well of you. This is, this is the first sermon. It sounds kind of crazy. Let, let me sum up Jesus' talking points for you. So according to Jesus, you've got good is poor, hungry, weeping, and hated. And you've got bad is rich, well-fed, happy, and liked. Now, this raises a few questions for me. And it should raise a few questions for you. So, for example, question number one. If I follow Jesus... Do I have to be poor, hungry, weeping, and hated? Okay, it's a valid question. Question number two. If I am poor, hungry, weeping, and hated, does that mean that I'm following Jesus the right way? And as I thought about this, I thought, man, th th I mean, this is a hard thing to, to sell. It's a hard thing to explain. And in fact, if it means that I have to be poor, hungry, weeping, and hated to follow Jesus, or if it means that by following Jesus, God is going to make me poor, hungry, weeping, and hated, then I'm not sure that I want to follow Jesus, or at least I'm not sure I want to follow Him right now. See, you may have a car payment out there. You may have just bought a brand new car. And maybe you want to wait until that car is paid for before you follow Jesus. Because then you, it's okay to be poor. Because it's okay to be poor with a paid-off car. It's hard to be poor with a car that you can't afford the note on every month. Or maybe you want to wait till the house is sorted. Or you want to wait until you know, you've got enough food in the pantry or whatever it is. You're like, okay, God, if this is the way it is, then I'm just going to wait. I'd rather kind of do this bad life. And I'd rather get rich and well-fed and happy and liked before I follow you. Then when I follow you then I kind of have everything in place. And when I first read this verse, and let's be honest, when we look at the Scripture, it, it's easy to do one of two things. Either one, over-spiritualize this thing and, and, and kind of say the, the Scripture and the words, but not really explain it and just, blessed are the poor. Oh, that sounds so wonderful. Oh, that sounds so great. I just love what the Bible says. Or the second thing that we can do is we can look at this and say, that doesn't make any sense at all. And in fact... I don't know that I want to live this good life because look at what comes out of it. Now, I can tell you, you know, fast forward a little bit. This is the way that, we, that you want to go. And so if you find yourself, just a special note, if, if you're rich, we want to help you go from bad to good. So we have a bank account set up here at the church <laughs> for you to... <laughs> we are stewarding your spirituality very well. Okay, you can, yeah, no, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. Listen, if you're offended at that, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what I want to do now is I want to I explain what Jesus means here. Because when we get what Jesus meant when he said this here, it points us to a good life. It does. Take my word on it. I promise you that when we do this here, it takes you to a good life. And so we start with this, blessed are you who are poor. You know, when Jesus said the word, Josh, go ahead and throw that slide on the screen for everybody. When Jesus says this, blessed are you who are poor. You know, when he used this word poor, the word that he meant for poor, actually it means serious or severe poverty. So what Jesus meant by, by being poor is this is somebody that has absolutely nothing to their name. They have absolutely nothing in their life. They don't have a shirt on their back. They don't have sandals on their feet. They have no food. This is the person that's laying in the ditch. 
on the side of the road. This is a person who has utterly nothing. This is a broken down person that is in serious and severe poverty. That's somebody on the brink of death. That's somebody on just the edge of barely even being alive. That's the poor person that he said is blessed. But you know why he said that? Because when somebody is that poor, guess what? They know that everything they receive is a gift. And everything that they receive means something incredibly special. You know, if I walk down the road and I, and I give, or if I walk out into this audience and I give somebody in here a bar one, it's like, great, I love candy, amazing. But if I find somebody that is serious and severe in poverty, then, then I, I could leave the wrapper of a bar one on the side of a road and they would pick it up and see if there's anything in it and count it as a blessing if there's something that's in it. See, what Jesus is saying here is, is, is he wants us to know that this is the blessed person because this is the person that knows that they need somebody to provide every single thing that they, that they have that they need. You cannot, as a poor person, you cannot provide anything for yourself. You can't, you can't satisfy any, any need that you have financially, clothing, food, nothing. And so when Jesus says the words, blessed are you who are poor, he's saying blessed are you who realizes that you are nothing, that you have nothing, that you can obtain nothing, that you can do absolutely nothing by your own hands or by your own work or with your own way or in your own intent. You realize that you've got flat out zilch, nothing and zero. And what happens in that moment is, is we get this, this point of contact with Jesus. See, the, the first point of contact between your soul and God is not when you realize what you have. But when, it's when you realize what you have not. See, th this is why this leads us to a good place. Jesus isn't saying, blessed are you who are poor because you're poor. He's saying, blessed are you who are poor because just like, like the beggar realizes how much he needs somebody else to provide for him, you realize how much you need Jesus or how much you need your community to provide for you. And in fact, I, I found this statement that I just love so much. The, the blessing of the poor... Is, is first. So when we look at this, this sermon that Jesus said, the first thing that he says in it is, blessed are you who are poor. And it's first because without the beggar's reliance, and this beggar's reliance is this idea that if I don't have something from you, then I'm going to die. Me as a poor person, if you don't give me food, it's not that I'm going to be hungry, it's that I'm going to just expire. If you don't give me something to wear, then I'm going to freeze in the night. It's this reliance this, or this, this understanding that as a beggar, you have nothing. And when you apply that same mentality that people could understand, because when he's preaching, when Jesus is talking, there are people like this on their way to the temple, on their way to hear Jesus talk. Even out in the crowd, people have brought people to Jesus for healing because they are so poor and they're in such need. See, Jesus knew that people could identify with this. And he wanted to connect with this and say, when you get to the absolute bottom of your own reliance, when you then adopt the beggar's reliance on God's power, and, and that nothing can be done in your strength, but everything will be done in God's strength, then yes, I can confirm that blessed are you who are poor. You know, I'm so thankful in my life that I can do nothing to make this church work. I'm so thankful in my life that I can do nothing to inspire you guys to Jesus. I'm so thankful that in my life, I could do nothing for a long season to even try and keep myself alive. I'm so thankful that there is nothing in me that qualifies me or makes me good enough to be here on stage in front of you. You know why? Because I have an absolute beggar's reliance that God does something here on a Sunday morning for you. And I have an absolute beggar's reliance that God is going to hold my marriage together. He's going to hold my finances together. He's going to hold this church together. And you know what? I come down here on a Saturday night with a beggar's reliance on God to show up for you. So that when you walk through these doors on a Sunday morning, God ha has, he does something in your life. Because it's not by what we as South Point can do. It's not about what Chris and Casey can do. It's not about what you can do. See, I'm poor, and I'm thankful for it. 
Because I'm so poor, it means that God is my provider of everything. And when I look around in my life, I see every single thing that has been provided, it comes from God. That, hey, it is a blessing to be poor, right? So there's one out of four. We've just taken from how can this be to praise God. This is, this is the real deal. Blessed are you who are poor because then you get to rest in the fact that God is your provider. And he provides everything. So that's one down. Let's go to the next one. Blessed are you who hunger. Guess what Jesus meant by this? Guess what happens when you're hungry? When you're hungry, I don't know if you guys know the term hangry. It's, it's when you get so, yeah, we know it. When you get so hungry, you're like angry. I looked at Casey the other night. I came home, and I was hungry, and the kids needed to be bathed, and there was a whole process for the evening. And I just said, when am I going to eat? When is this going to happen? I was, I, was, I was hungry. I was hangry. But blessed are you who hunger. See, what, what a hungry person does is a hungry person seeks. And when they seek, they look... They look for food and hope to satisfy. See, Jesus is saying, blessed are you who are hungry because blessed are you who seeks to satisfy. A hunger is something that that you have inside of you that you want to go away. You want to satisfy it. You want to fill it. You want want it to be filled. And, And Jesus is saying, if you're hungry, you're a person that is seeking food. But also, if you're hungry, you're a person that could be seeking Me, that can be seeking my presence. So how hungry are you in your life? It's one thing to raise your hand and pray and say, God, please fix my car. Or God, please make my marriage come back together. Or Lord Jesus, please just help me with my family or give me this miracle job. God, why won't you do this miracle in my life? Why won't you heal this sickness in my family? Why won't you help take care of me when things are going wrong? Why, God, are you letting me go through such a hard season? And God is looking down at you and he's saying, hey, are you hungry? Are you seeking? Yes, it's one thing to ask and say, why, 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 why? But it's another thing to say, I have a need and I'm going to seek my creator, my savior, the God that sent his son to die on the cross for me. I'm going to be a seeker and I'm going to seek with the intent that Jesus is going to be the thing that gives me hope and satisfies me. See, it's not, it's not about being hungry for food, but Jesus knew that this was a perfect metaphor for people that were listening to him. Jesus is saying, are you hungry? Do you want me? Do you want to seek me? Because I'll satisfy you better than anything else that there is. In fact, the only good thing that can satisfy your hunger and leave you still wanting more is Jesus. So what is it that's in your life that you're wanting more or that you're seeking help. Hey, be hungry. And by being hungry, be a seeker and seek Jesus. But just seek him as your provider. Now, the third thing that Jesus talked about in his message, he says, Blessed are you who weep. And ready, set, go. Blessed are you who weep. Now, th- th- this was a hard one for me to understand. I had to do a bit of digging, but the word that he uses here for weep is the word to mourn. So it's blessed are you who mourn. And the thing that you're mourning for, as you mourn, is you're mourning for the low and needy condition. You're mourning for for the idea that other people are hurting and that there's an individual or there's a society out there that needs God or that that needs help or that needs healing or that, that, that needs hope, that needs something. And so this blessed are you who weep, Jesus is saying, blessed are you who mourn for others that are in need or need help. See, what this is, is Jesus is is helping us understand where our priorities should be. Jesus is saying, hey, do you care about other people that are around you? Do you care about the society that you live in? Because if you do, if you're mourning that with, with a sorrow, with a hurt, with a burden for those people, then those are the people that are blessed. So let me just quick survey. Do we live in a country that consists of, in, of an individual or a society that needs Jesus or that is broken? Yes, we do. Do we live in a world that needs this? Yes, we do. Hey, guess what? Do you live on a street in Pinelands or Rondebosch or Kensington or Athlone or wherever it is that you're from where somebody on your road or, or some, some gang or some culture or some family group or an individual just needs Jesus because they're low and they're in a needy condition? And the question you ask yourself is, do you care about that? See, you don't have to necessarily be the problem solver. But Jesus is just saying, are you you moved 
about that. And so there's, there's a verse that, that I, I think is, to me, explains a lot. And when you think about mourning, you also can think about the word sorrow. There's godly sorrow, and then there's earthly sorrow. And I just want to make sure that we get this straight, uh, because I don't want to confuse the two. And so Paul, he tells us in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, he says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. So when Jesus is talking about this mourning, he's talking about this sorrow, it always leads to repentance. It always leads to a, a, a situation of forgiveness with no regret. It leads to somebody, that individual or that society, having nothing to regret in their life but just walking towards Jesus. I mean, what would happen to our roads, our streets? What would happen to your neighbor or to your marriage or to your best friend if we started to really care about them and we started to really take, take their situation to heart and mourn that for them and we started to help them realize that, hey, there is no regret in Jesus. It's conviction that brings you to God and condemnation that drives you away. That, that's, why, that's why I put these cards in your chairs, the save a seat card. That, that whole save a seat card is, is, is this, this point. Blessed are you who weep. Do you care about the empty chair in the room? I care. And I know a lot of you do care. We have empty chairs in here. And these empty chairs, every single empty chair represents somebody that needs Jesus. Somebody that you know that could come in here. And, and that, that's why those are there. So let's go to the last one here as we wrap up. Blessed are you when people hate you. Blessed are you when people hate you. This is a fun one. This is a really fun one because we all love to be hated. We do. We all, yeah, we all absolutely love to be hated. And what Jesus is saying when he, when he says this is that it's okay to be in the world, but not made of the world. It's okay to be in the world, but not made of the world. And when Jesus is telling, blessed are you who are hated, Jesus is saying, blessed are you who know what your identity is. Blessed are you who've decided who it is that you're going to be. Because when you say, you know what, I am a Christ follower, I am a Jesus follower, or even just this is my identity and I'm not going to be all things to all people to try and fit in with everybody. Instead, I'm just going to be me. I'm just going to be Chris. And I'm going to let people like me for who I am. Or if people don't like me, they don't have to like me. But I don't have to be made of the world. I don't have to be like everybody else in the world because I don't need the approval of the world. And so when Jesus is saying, blessed are you who are hated, he knows that as a Christian, you are going to deal with persecution. And he knows that as a Christian, you're going to be called out. You're going to be called a hypocrite because a whole bunch of people are going to be so excited when you fail or you do something wrong or you tell a lie. You know, they're going to be right there next to you say, I, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you said you were a Christ follower. And Jesus is saying, hey, I know it's going to be tough to choose this path. It's the good path, not the attractive path. And when you choose the good path, there's going to be people that come along that criticize you for it. But you know what? Because you've got your mindset right, because it doesn't matter what everyone else thinks, it only matters what I, Jesus, think, then that leads you to this incredible place of freedom. That, that, le that means you can shake off what everybody else says. And you can shake off what everybody else thinks. And Jesus is saying, hey, well done, because you know who you are and nothing is going to shake you or waver you from that. And so those are the first four things in Jesus' message. He says, blessed are you who are poor. But you know what that means? It's blessed are you who are humble. And then he says, blessed are you. And the next one he says, blessed are you that are hungry. And then what he's really saying there is blessed are you that, that, that strives. Blessed are you that, that, that is driven. Blessed are you that, that comes from me. And when he says, blessed are you that, that weep, what he really is saying is, blessed are you who are, a, who are compassionate. You're a compassionate, caring person. And when he says, blessed are you who are hated, what he really is saying to us in that moment is, blessed are you who know who you are and comfortable in your own identity in me, in Christ. And so now all of a sudden those four things that was a hard sell at the beginning becomes a much easier sell. Turns out Jesus actually did know what was the best life. He did know what would point us on the best pattern. And so now just to finish this up, and, and we're just going to spend a minute on the woes, because the woes were, were the hard part. 
And, and then, then we'll pray and, and we'll finish the service out. But woe to the rich, woe to the fool, woe to the happy, woe to the liked by all. See, a rich person doesn't need anybody else or anything else. You know, when we um, moved to Cape Town, God called us to, he said, I'm going to call you to one of the hardest places that there is to take the gospel. And we said, okay, Lord, where's that going to be? And he took me, I was up on the mountain, I was praying over the southern suburbs, and he pointed me right at Bishop's Court and said, that's it, right there, Bishop's Court. It's one of the richest areas in all of South Africa. And if you live in Bishop's Court, there's no criticism to you. I mean, you're, you know, you're here, amazing. I know there's some amazing people in Bishop's Court because we've met them, incredible Christian people that are out there. But it's also some of, the, some of the richest. And some of the richest people, they don't need anyone else because they can supply everything that they have. So Jesus is saying, woe to the rich. Woe to the one that thinks they don't need anybody else because that's a lonely life. Woe to the fool. This means that you think you already know everything that you, that you need to know. It means you don't need to seek for anything. So it's woe to the one that is falsely satisfied. When Jesus says, woe to the happy, he's saying, hey, I, I, I feel so bad for you because, because you're, you're, you're putting a, kind of a false joy or a false wrapper on life. Like you're trying to drown out all the stuff that actually needs us to pay attention to it. And when he says, woe to the liked by all, what that means is that he's so sorry that your identity is, is trying to be put in everything and everyone and everywhere. I mean, I don't know if anyone can identify with that, but the idea of I just can't do enough to get enough people to like me. And, and that's not a great way to live. And see, this word woe that Jesus uses, it's an expression of regret and compassion. So when we go back and we look at Jesus' sermon and, and this is where we're going to land this plane. We're going to finish on this here. Is that you have this good life, or this good path to lead the good life. And then you've got all these other attractive things. And Jesus very clearly paints a picture of how to pursue the best life for you. And in that best life for you, it consists of, of the best things for you. And you may not always choose those things. And when you choose riches over, over poor, you know, the poor we talked about, or when you choose um, the attractive things over the good decisions, I just want you to know you can go back to that section in the Scripture where it says, woe to, and I just want you to know that this is an expression of regret and compassion. This is Jesus saying, hey, just remember that if you choose these other things, I have compassion for you. And my regret is, is for you because, man, you're going to regret what you're going to do. You're going to regret how this impacts your life. But I want you to know that I feel compassion for you. And so wherever it is that you find yourself on your road, whatever it is that you choose, you have a loving God that's behind you and that's for you. And so I'm going to invite uh, the band to come out and lead us in a song. But before you guys stand, what I want to do with this song is I just want to give you time. Because when you go out there... Life gets crazy and life just happens. And, and a lot of what God is maybe doing in your hearts in here now, as soon as you walk out those doors, the kids start screaming, the phone starts ringing, everything starts happening in life, and it's easy to just lose what God is doing in the room right now. So we bring the band up and we do one more song so that you can kind of let what's been done kind of soak and sit and kind of soak in your heart and in your mind. And so I'd invite you to sing and I would invite you to worship and be a part of this. But what I specifically want you to think about is, is the question that we started with. What is the best life for me? What is the best way for me to live this life? And I hope that, that out of what I spoke about, you can gather some things that can help your life, or that can help you make that decision. But really, start by asking, Jesus, what is the best life for me? And then hopefully this message has given you some confidence to know that the God above wants, He truly wants what's best for you. So I'm going to pray for us. Lord, I just pray.